call to order, Holchester Planning Commission, 706, August 6th. First deal we have tonight is public con comment on items not on the agenda. Anybody has any openings? All right, very good. So we're going to start out with our Mounts Bay Initiative, Future Development, and Sarah's going to give us an overview. overview. Sure. Um, so I, I think back in May from the public forum, um, there are some solutions identified, but there are also a number of concerns and the Planning Commission chose some of the most significant concern, concerns to pull out and um, have some meetings on to try and um, extrapolate, pull apart and understand a little bit better about what some of the concerns are. And so I think some of them we heard on the first um, on that forum, that walk and talk that we did prior to the forum. We walked down East Lakeshore Drive, we saw some of the existing development there and some of the new development that's gone on and heard about some of the concerns of blocking lake views, uh, some of the tree removal that was done. Um, the image on your right is a zoning violation that has gone to court for enforcement proceedings where they did build a bigger wall than what they should. Um, they did have more impervious area, they took out more landscaping. So perhaps not the best example of what the current rules and regulations allow for, but it really um, hit home with a lot of people in terms of the changing character of this area and that perhaps um, the regulations should be addressed for that area. So there are some underlying concerns and just some of the development that's occurring, regardless of whether or not we provide this area with additional infrastructure. And then there were concerns about, well, what would the additional um, infrastructure in sight in terms of additional development or increasing the rate of growth. So tonight we're just gonna walk through some of those issues. Um, I've had some emails um, from folks about what their specific concerns are that I wanna to provide to the Planning Commission. Just uh, a reminder, we are live. I will try and check my email intermittently throughout this. So if people have um, any questions or things that they wanna pass along to the board, they're watching from home, email is S had S H A D D at Colchester VT dot gov. Um, I'll relay those as best as possible. Please uh, put your full name in it as well as your address so we can put that into the planning commission records if you're emailing. So a little bit about where the inner bay neighborhood is. This is the area that we identify in our town plan as the inner bay. Um, you can see it's everything from Coates Island. Let me see if I can grab the laser pointer. Coates Island, and it comes back along Prim Road, and then back over through Diversity Hill, over to Mounts Bay Ave, right around Thomas Drive and Bluebird, um, over Blakely, along the interstate, and basically incorporates all the Williams Road, East Lakeshore Drive, West Lakeshore Drive, and out to Goodsell Point. So when we talk about zoning districts, we're really looking at this area as a whole and sort of how it functions together. But for the purposes of tonight, and what we're gonna sort of zoom in on, is what the sewer service area is. So you can see it's outlined in red. It's a <coughs> limited portion of this neighborhood. Um, so what I'll sort of walk you through is sort of a snippet of different zoning districts within this area. Um, so I'll walk you through the outline of what was proposed to be the sewer service area and what we're looking at to try and provide some level of wastewater infrastructure too. So you still have Prim Road over here in Coates Island, and this is West Lakeshore Drive. It comes through intersection with East Lakeshore and Blakely, and then East Lakeshore Drive, all the way out to where it turns up into Bay Road. It forks off, and this is the Goodsell Point area. It's a very limited portion. This big parcel is the Hazlet Strip Casting, corporation parcel in between. Um, you'll see that's the only parcel really here that's split zoned and up along the front is LS2 and the back is industrial. But other than that, the best way to sort of describe this area is all the parcels that are immediately touching West Lakeshore Drive from the corner with Prim all the way back through East Lakeshore and then East, L East Lakeshore out to Goodsell Point and then this portion of Goodsell Point. So. That's what we're looking at tonight. So a little bit about what the zoning is. Um, you can see all the blue shade is your R2 district. That allows for only residential, and R2 means two units per acre roughly. It's 
one unit for 20,000 square feet um, in acres, 43,560 square feet. So it's roughly two per acre. The light yellow, which there's only a few snippets of in the sewer service area, it's on Good Cell Point is R1, which is one unit per acre or one unit per 40,000 square feet. Again, only allows for residential. And then you have some floodplain right tight to the lake, which is not visible at this scale. You have LS2, which is this green, which is Lakeshore 2. You have the purple, which is Lakeshore 2. And you have this parcel here in pink, which is the back end of the Hazlet parcel, and that's industrial. And you have a couple other areas that I'll note of that border this area that aren't in the area, which is GD1, which is mixed use. And you have a bigger chunk of R1 up here in Shore Acres. Again, these are areas that are outside of what was proposed to be that service area. Mark. Sarah, can you explain um, when all that area is R2, the density seems much higher than, than that. Is that because it's... So we've only had zoning since 1955. And a lot of that development occurred prior to zoning. A lot of that development occurred prior to the current zoning. So you have an area that, as we run through sort of the analysis of what does build out of this area look like, you can see that it's already pretty built out in some areas. You have, on certain parcels, you have more development than we would allow under current zoning. Um, so again, it's a little bit of a mix of new development, old pre-existing development, sites that have been redeveloped. Um, I think it's worth noting that under our rules, when you have something there, you have a right to continue using it, to tear it down and rebuild it, um, and in some cases even build it a little bit larger. We're taking a look at the number of units, usually with residential, how many dwelling units are on that parcel. There are also setbacks and other things that apply, um, but for tonight's purposes, we'll be looking mostly at that build out. Any other questions on the zoning? Yeah. Um, so I had down, I, I'm confused a little bit about the build out of commercial. Is that, how do you determine, it looks like the capacity, it looked like one million. I'll feet. get there in a minute. So let okay. me, let me go through the overview first okay. and then we'll get into those numbers at the end. But, okay. um, I think just to provide an overview in terms of the districts, your LS1 and LS2 are actually new districts. Back in 2015, 2016, the Planning Commission looked to adopt new zoning districts specifically for this area. We've been working on a long range vision for West Lakeshore Drive for 15, 20 years. Um, we've taken a couple of charrettes, a couple of public input sessions um, over those decades. And we had a vision um, that we finally solidified into what that means in terms of development regulations and incorporated into the regulations. So your LS1 and LS2 districts are relatively new. Your R1 and R2 districts are relatively old. They're more traditional, just exclusive zoning districts. Um, your floodplain is a no-build area. Again, we have some development that's occurred in the floodplain. Um, it's there, it's pre-existing, it has a right to remain. It can't be substantially improved unless people floodproof. Um, and you have the industrial district too, which is relatively old traditional zoning. Your LS1 and LS2, just to give a quick overview on what those do differently, and we can talk more about this later on, is the LS1 was made to be just that zoning along the lake. It was really designed to be a lakeside zoning. Um, new single family homes are not allowed as a permitted use in it, they'd have to be conditionally reviewed. It really gives prioritization to recreation, um, parks, marinas, those sorts of lake recreational type uses um, and decreases the amount of residential infill that you can have. It also limits um, homes to 20 feet to the ridge along the lake. Your LS2 district is a little bit more mixed use. It allows for a variety of commercial, I'd call it a little bit of light commercial. It was designed with traffic in mind, realizing that we only have this one corridor that goes through the area that we have capacity issues with. So no drive-throughs or drive-ups are allowed. 
um, really try to focus on sort of the smaller businesses, um, sit down restaurants with outdoor seating, um, office, um, residential is also allowed, um, other services, specialty retail. Um, so it was designed to try and preserve the character of the area, enhance it. There is There are design standards associated with it as well. Um, and allow for infill development regardless of whether or not there are services to the area. So that's a little bit about the thinking. Um, you know, I think some of you were around. Are you around for, yes, you're around for yeah, the district. Right. I think you're the only the last man standing on that, um, except for Mr. Sheck. So um, any questions on the zoning districts before I move along? And we can zoom in and zoom out on these in a little bit here too. Um, so your R1, I try to do this with um, the ortho photos so you can see a little bit of the development that's underneath. It really hugs the road in the East Lakeshore Drive area. You have Spring Hill Road up here, so you have some, and you also have Ledge. The bike path goes through up in here. So you do have some Areas that are not fully developed under the current regulations that some infill could go, but again, you get into very tight knit density alongside the road. Um, and this parcel, which goes back in here, is actually, I believe, part of Smith Estates, which was subdivided off here and the density sent over here to the Fox Run area. Here's a better zoom in of your LS1, LS2, and industrial areas. So you can see the LS1 standing out a little bit better um, as everything that's right alongside the road. You have, to orient you on this, you have the Bayside Hazlet parcel here, which the town owns. You have Upper and Lower Bayside Park. You have the campground. You have the front end of Hazlet here. West Lakeshore Drive coming through. And you have around the bingo hall here, and <coughs> Shore Acres comes in through here. And the um, shopping plaza is over here, the fishing access here, and the town cemetery right in through there. That little snippet that's pulled out is actually floodplain, it's along the creek. So I think I'll get to Sarita's question now, if no one else has any questions on the zoning district. So I tried to visually represent some of the numbers. Um, I'll walk you through this a little bit because it could get a little bit confusing. So the blue are the zoning districts. The green is what's here for development right now. So with a build analysis, you start by saying, well, What's on the ground right now? Uh, how many units do you have um, of up top is residential, down below you have commercial. And then you start to apply a rate of growth and moving it forward each year. And in this case, we chose a 0.55% base rate of growth, which we maybe see now in a good year. Um, it's been a very slow and steady infill on East Lakeshore Drive, West Lakeshore Drive. Um, this gets you in the vicinity, I think, of somewhere in the, te the upper teens in terms of new units per every decade. So that would average, if they're like 1.6, not even quite two per year, which we have not seen. Applying this rate of growth and doing a bill analysis, which we worked with regional planning to do, what they do is they put everything into a program called Community Viz. And that says, well, you need so much space for your setbacks, uh, for you can only have so much impervious area, you have to take out steep slopes and wetlands, a variety of other sort of constraints. And with the land that you have left, how many units could you place on it? At what point in the future do you get to the point where numerically, and also physically, you can't put more units on the land. 
And so that's in orange over here of if you go out and we looked at from 2018, 2028, 2038, 48, we went out 50 years and the number of new units that could be added during that time. And then we looked at if you just went out to the end of time, how many units could you put in under the current zoning? And then the last column in gray is new units and existing units. So how many total units would there be? So walking you through how to sort of read this and we can come back to this too. I did this with a 0.55 rate of growth and then on the next one we doubled that. Um, really assuming that growth and development just took off and we went double of anything that we see now. Um, these highlighted areas in orange or yellow, and sorry to my planning commissioners, I should be pointing down below <laughs> on the one for you too, but these odd ones are when you reach build out in a particular area. So you can see in the top one for residential units, in the LS1 and the R1 districts, in 2028, you're built out applying this rate of growth. Um, you get to a point where you just can't add more to the land. But there are some like LS2 where you just don't get to that during this 50 year time horizon. And then down along the bottom, the running total of you start with 277 units in the first year. And then 2028, you add, what is that? 316. And you get to 293. So you're adding somewhere in the teens for growth every year, somewhere in the 16 to 20 variety. In the bottom one, we looked at commercial. And as I said, there are certain districts that we just don't allow for commercial in. You can see there's some existing in the R2 district. There's some existing in the floodplain. But we really, um, and then Alice 2 gets built out pretty quickly. But you take a look at the LS2 and industrial districts, and those are the two that have the most potential for growth. So I think the key thing is, as I flip forward, that total column on the right-hand side won't change the new yet net units. It's just the rate. So we can take a look at various rates of what if development tripled within the area or quadrupled. Um, but just wanted to give you sort of a slow and steady versus a high end um, to start with. We can rerun this if we need to in different ways, but the number of new units overall at the end of time won't change. Sorry to challenge you, but is it true that that there's um, capacity without the sewer to build up to this degree? So this does not take a look at sewer or no sewer. This takes a look at just purely the zoning in the land and the regulations. So the rate would be slower if it's constrained by sewer capacity. In fact, it would never get to the end. Well, so there are a variety of things that you can do to limit development. And lack of infrastructure is one of them. Um, lack of potable water, lack of uh, wastewater solutions. Um, so that definitely retards the rate of growth. <coughs> but whenever you create a zoning district, you have to assume at some point you will get to full build out. It's just a matter of when. So I think in terms of any, I think this is true with everything that you've looked at in the past, is when you create new zoning or you change zoning, you should always be looking at where could this lead to, regardless, because there could be new sewer or new septic technologies 10, 20 years from now um, that allow you to recirculate in your house. Who knows? But the zoning in terms of the land use plan of where we want to go should remain that sort of steady north um, star. 
This is all but complicated, so please, questions. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Just to the 55, the 0.55% base growth rate, is that a, how do you arrive at the growth rate that you use to make these projections? So, I'll skip ahead. So we can take a look at where we've been in terms of residential growth rates and where we've been recently and take a look at our array of growth. Um, in the commercial sector, a really, really, really good year historically has been 1% or thereabouts. Um, we've not, we've plateaued a bit in terms of housing units and housing growth. So 0.55 was what we've seen in more recent years, town-wide. And then the next one, which I'll jump to, is looking at that 1% growth rate for residential, 0.75% uh, um, for non-residential. And again, we can <coughs> run these numbers a variety of different ways, but just wanted to start with something that was sort of close to what we had and then taking a look at essentially doubling that. Any other questions so far? Well, I'm just looking at the chart and some of the numbers don't make sense to me. Maybe I, I'm just not adding them right. For instance, I'm looking at the residential R2. The Top graph or lower graph? Uh, the, uh, the, the residential one? The upper one, yep. Yeah, R2, 2068, it says 239 would be the, what would have additional units, the total units. But in the last column, it says new net plus existing is 233, which is a number lower than that. Right. So, so we're rounding to the nearest decade. And so you really get to that build out somewhere between 2058 and 2068. Right, but it's, you said the last column, that would be the maximum, right? Right. So shouldn't the number be the same or more? Right, and so that's one of the things that, you know, um, I appreciate the level of accuracy that regional planning strive to give us. If you just apply the rate of growth and hit 2068, you get to 239, but there's only capacity on the land for 233 units. So you we should get correct to that. 239. You would never get to 239. Okay. So um, this may be a roundabout way of uh, getting to some information. It may not even relate to what we're doing, but in the 214 economic development report and in 218 business analysis. Both of them, when they were looking at commercial growth in Colchester, said that one of the things that's holding back commercial growth is um, infrastructure, including sewer. And so I also know that the commercial taxes that uh, businesses pay is a little bit below where it's recommended that you know it should be a little bit higher in terms of commercial to residential. Um, so I feel like it puts a little bit more burden on cultural <coughs> taxpayers. And I'm wondering, not developing, let's say people don't want to develop it, has anybody done like a cost? benefit analysis of building it up, what the commercial taxes would be, um, because I'm not seeing a lot of residential growth happening in Colchester. I think it's 1.3 this most recent year, which is not a lot. I, I just feel like over time, a more the taxpayer is going to have to pick up more of a burden for the school and services without some commercial growth. And also the benefit of the local option tax that we would get. So well. one of the things when you take a look at where we're going, and this is from our 2017 housing analysis update that was incorporated into the town plan, is um, 
looking at our population projections in terms of how much additional growth will we see? Um, and we can flip back to what was our housing growth over the 60s, 70s, 80s? It was phenomenal. We jumped up quite a bit. We were growing like gangbusters. Right. Um, our population has flattened off in terms of an increase. And what the demographic forecasters are looking at for the state of Vermont is actually we're going to lose population. <coughs> we're getting older. Uh, we're not replacing ourselves as quickly. Um, Shannon County and Colchester still continue to grow. We're growing at a very slow and steady rate. Um, but compared to Chinon County, Colchester is growing much less, has a much slower growth. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Wilson has a much faster growth rate because they started with fewer people. So if you take a look at where they, their population doubled over the past like 20 or 30 years, however, the population is still less than us. So when you get to the point where you have a larger population, you could be adding more people and have a slower growth rate than a smaller town that's adding a lot of people. Okay. So, so that explains why St. George is doing so well. St. George is doing, George is doing George very well and I one town in the wish them well. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's always useful to say, well, what are you comparing things to? Are you comparing apples to apples? Yeah. Um, but just in terms of trying to increase either residential or commercial growth, this is what we're up against. Um, we, I think as you said in that business analysis, we're up against, we're located in the state of Vermont. Um, no matter what we do, we're only going to be growing by so much and the demographics are working a little bit against us. Um, if you have questions about why we're still continuing to grow and add a lot more housing units, even though our population has leveled off, the 2017 housing analysis is great. It walks you through some of the demographics of our household types is shrinking. We have non-traditional households. So you have the same number of people needing to live in more places. So this is a lot of heavy concepts to get through tonight, but it all sort of impacts how we get from point A to point B. I'm just wondering if the community is aware that it, to limit commercial growth, they, that the that the taxpayers will have to compensate for that. So, I mean, I, I just think people should be aware of that. That, you know, there's a price to pay for everything you do or every decision you make. But, um, you know, I guess it did say that there was a lot of support for this plant. When you were developing the Lake One and the LS1 and LS2, it seems like the community had a good amount of input. So I just have to assume they support, you know, the, the recent plan that we submitted and the LS1 and LS2. I, I think there's a lot of community involvement in it. Uh, we took a lot of time and we're very thorough with it and went through a lot of different reiterations of it. Um, so it wasn't something that we rushed into at all. I think it was very carefully considered by the Planning Commission at the time. But. To answer, I think, your other question, too, so it's fairly easy to do a build-out analysis when you're taking a look at just residential, because you can only do residential. <laughs> so the number of residential units um, you arrive at can be um, fairly simply put. However, when you're taking a look at the mixed-use areas, you have to make a few assumptions. And the assumption that we put forward here was equal amounts commercial to residential. So it's balanced. Mm -hmm. It could go one way or the other. And so you could see in the LS2 particularly, a decrease in the commercial square footage, increase in the number of residential units, potentially. And just for perspective on the total build out in, in commercial, I, I don't know square footage. I mean, it's like um, Hazlet, like what, in terms of what is that square footage? Like this, you know, that roughly, like even if it was just 500,000 square feet or 250,000 square feet, what, what is Costco's building would be what, 150? It's around 100. 150,000. Just over 100,000? Okay. That gives you an idea what Costco's yeah. building is. It's yeah, that, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. 
say Bibbins is probably around more like 20. Okay. You want an example of that? Um, but that helps. Costco helps. So many buildings or how many, how big your buildings, what you're looking at, what you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So you can see that really where you're adding new potential units is going to be your LS2, which is that new zoning district, and then your R2, which is that area along East Lakeshore Drive. Those are the two significant areas. You get to at total build out, 113 units, um, and 51 of those are in R2, and 60 of those are in LS2. Can you explain again what that net new units column represents? That represents that point in the future where you reach full build out under the regulations. So it goes beyond the 2068 timeline to just hit fast forward and everything's built to the last square inch that it could be built to. And for commercial square footage, if you take a look at LS1 and LS2, those are relatively small. It's that, that one, one split zone industrial piece which adds in the 1.3 million. So it's, you know, in terms of, as you look to possible solutions to limit growth, rezoning the entirety of that parcel might be something potentially to look at. But then we lose revenue. <coughs> Again, we're just looking at it in terms of the development concerns about yeah. too much massing, what have you, all the things that the Planning Commission usually looks at. But if you could get his name and have, sorry, but would you? Come to the mic. Tom, Tom's sitting right next to the mic, so the camera guy got him. But apologize and if you could give us your name. Fine. Alan Sexton, Malisby Avenue. Um, now, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned there were some properties uh, in Williams Road on East Lakeshore. That it it sounds like there's zoning violations there. Yes. Um, now that's one example. Are there? Punitive actions being taken against? That's currently an environmental court. Uh, we're waiting for a court ruling on that. You are. Okay. So people who are intentionally trying to violate or maybe not intentionally, who knows? You know, trying to get away with something. I. Who knows? Um, but my concern is um, as far as planning goes, you know, um, or zone. How is it that those structures were allowed to be built, such as they are? That's certainly quite different than what was there. So the re current regulations do allow, as I said, if you have an existing use there, a single family home, what have you, you can knock it down and rebuild it under the current regulations. And the current regulations allow you to go to 40 feet in the R2 district, which those are in. When we created the new LS1 district, we decided to limit it because of concerns about lake views and what have you, yeah. but the R2 district along East Lakeshore does not have that limit. It doesn't. So that's something planning could address? I, I think that's part of why we're having this tonight. Yeah, that might be a good idea. I grew up down there and I, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the lake there now is cleaner than it was in, well, I don't want to date myself with the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm concerned when I see, you know, I was coming down Williams Road the other day and when I saw this big green wall, that's a big concern. That's quite different than what was there. You know, there's no trees, there's just this big green wall. Um, that to me is gonna create a problem, you know, and, uh, you know, if zoning's being violated, then, you know, permit, I can't do it on my property on Malisby Avenue, you know. Yep. It's gotta be a price to pay, and, you know, it shouldn't be the bay that's paying the price. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. 
I'll flip to the higher growth rate. I'll walk you through that a little bit. You can still see you get to build out residentially in the LS1 and R1 pretty quickly in 2028. R2 you get there in 2048 and you don't hit build out at all during the 50 year time horizon in the LS2 district. If you take a look at commercial, again, R2 floodplain, you're there immediately, but in 2038, you reach build out in the LS1 district and it still is LS2 and industrial that you don't get to at all during the 50 year time horizon. So in terms of, if you want to imagine a faster rate of growth, you could just imagine that you build out that LS2 of the 42,000 square feet a lot quicker, or the 1.3 in the industrial district within that 50 year time horizon or something of that nature. Um, again, you're taking a look at a higher rate of growth where you're adding close to, I think, 30 units a year which the town of Colchester as a whole adds right now somewhere between 40 and a good year in the 50s for new units total town-wide. What really springs us up um, and can fluctuate us is the Grove Center. We have a new building about, I think the new building is 29 units is coming online. We issued in the past year that will jump us up. So that's the most that we see in a given year is one new building at Severance Corners that will tip the scales that way. So we're increasing this rate of growth to these decade intervals in terms of putting a Severance Corners at um, the Lakeshore. So this is in terms of why 1% one, 1 might not seem like a whole huge rate of growth, but we went to um, something that we couldn't imagine going beyond. W was there consideration when, when I'm going to jump into the, the sewer because yeah, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what Sarita just said. Was there consideration during the sewer proposal uh, on the cost or the local option tax coming in for, from the commercial use if there were no infrastructure constraints or if the sewer went through, would that benefit, I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna answer my own question, but would that benefit uh, the payback or the, the revenue uh, produced with the local option tax? It could, and I think what I tried to describe in staff notes is there are different reasons for doing different types of build outs. This is a very different type of build out than any sort of financial analysis. Yeah. This is purely looking at what the worst case development concerns are. So this takes a look at if you pull the lid off of development, what could happen? Versus I think a lot of the financial analysis that was done about how to pay for the sewer was taking a look at what's the worst case scenario in terms Which of users and payback to ensure that there would be that payback over a certain time period. Um, so obviously if you hit this rate of growth and you had any indebtedness or payback it would occur a lot quicker and be financially better. But you um, got a plan for the but worst But there are case, obviously yeah. reasons why on development end, in terms of community character, you might not want this rate of growth. Right. But that's right. a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Is this based on uh, permitted, permitted we're going to do septics or sewer, or whatever we do, were we assuming that we were going to be able to put some type of sewer septic? Or was this based on what we have for land? So this is what we have for land and the development regulations. This is regardless of infrastructure. This is taking a look at just if you apply the development constraints and you can run the analysis with taking a look at septic suitable soils, um, but we chose not to because part of what the planning commission is charged with looking at is wastewater alternatives. So if you believe that there will be a solution found whether it's community septic or sewer that would address the wastewater concerns under our current development regulations, what could occur yeah. with the land that's available? <coughs> Just one more question. Just is the community uh, center the capacity for, the, for a 
future community center figured in in the sewer capacity. So in terms of the gallons per day needed? Yeah, I guess so. So there was the existing gallons per day needed. It was around 80,000. And then the future build out of that area was around 120 that was needed for the entire area. And I believe that there was some consideration given to the build out of the town parks as part of that um, future analysis of the 120. Okay. I assume the 120 goes based off of these, this growth. Um, it's a bit more complicated sure. because this just gives you commercial square footage, your bulk, your size, how big of buildings, how many buildings could you have. It's a little bit more of a stab in the dark when you're projecting sewer use because it's like, well, are we going to have a hotel or a restaurant? Or are we going to have two hotels and five restaurants that are your bigger water consumers? Um, so um, I wouldn't really necessarily be the best person to speak to that build analysis that was done for needed wastewater capacity and flow analysis. Is the land build out making sense? And Sorry, the it's and the community has agreed to this. The community has said, you know, we agreed to this plan, this these 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 uh, rates of growth. I'm not sure what you mean. Well, in the town plan, I'm assuming because it was accepted, the 219 town plan, and this is in our in the town plan. This, th these graphs are not in our town not plan. Not the graphs, but the uh, possible future buildups, the total buildup. <coughs> the community supported that and supported the heritage plan, right? So the zoning districts were at the times so the R1 and R2 are old. I'm not sure when they were fully adopted, mm -hmm. but they've been around oh, for quite nice. some time. Okay. The LS1 and okay. LS2, when those were brought forward by the Planning Commission, um, I think were not very contentious by the end. I think there was community support, um, but I'd like to sort of tease apart what you said a little bit more. The town plan gives that sort of vision for the town. And what the t current 2019 town plan says is uh, no changes in the LS1 and LS2. Those are two relatively new districts. Um, but it does say planning commission really needs to take a look at East Lakeshore Drive during the term of this plan. Within two years of adoption, the planning commission needs to do something with East Lakeshore Drive because of the concerns like what you heard tonight. Um, and so I, I think communities actually said they want us to take a look and fix East Lakeshore Drive. Um, I'm not sure that there's necessarily community support for the rate of growth, but I think there is community support for some of the zoning in that area. But I think there needs to be, as part of any planning commission process, when you take a look at zoning, I think you need to go out to the community in a much more expanded way than just tonight and say, East Lakeshore Drive, what are some of the concerns? As part of any sort of rezoning process, we usually start out with those mailings to any people that we possibly are going to impact, direct mailings, and invite them out just to that issue. We're looking at this one particular issue very broadly within the context of wastewater right now. So um, I think it would be deserving of a larger community push. I, I don't mean to talk so much tonight, but I guess one no. of the concerns I have that the, why the sewer um, was voted down was this perception of growth, you know, commercial growth, um, more traffic. And I'm just confused in terms of do we need to go back to the community and say that's a possibility with whether it's a septic or it's another form of wastewater treatment? Because um, I just, because that it seems like that's a reality in terms of it would it what is approved would be growth. It might not not be a rapid growth, but I'm just wondering with the community if we need to go back to them or not. Our task is too narrow. Still, our, ta me. our task is still too narrow for that. We're still looking for best solution for wastewater for that area. I You're think using this as a tool to get there. Yeah. But as far as the community and the growth part, yeah. I don't think that's part of what we're looking at. I mean, it's part of that, what we think is the best use. Yeah. Correct? 
but it's not part of our task. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, so we'd have to go back. Yeah. Could, could part of that best use be a rezoning of East Lakeshore Drive to reduce your wastewater output? For yes. example, theoretically, that could be an LS1, LS2 district, obviously would change these numbers right. pretty significantly. Yes, and so I think what I tried to lay on staff notes, and I'll skip ahead a little bit here, is so there are things that you can do. Rezoning is definitely one of them. You could create a new zoning district for East Lakeshore Drive. Um, because all we're looking at right here now are numbers. We're not talking about design. Um, when the LS1 and LS2 were created for West Lakeshore Drive, um, and we haven't had a new building built yet under new, new regulations, there are requirements about limiting the height along the lake, inciting things to preserve lake views. Um, there are reduced setbacks, but it talks about putting the building in the middle of the lot and trying to keep the sides open so you can sort of see through to the lake. Um, and also trying to be more pedestrian friendly and not be sort of a solid wall, um, having porches and other things that sort of interact with the street and neighbors. Um, but if you're concerned that the R2 development could be too much, you're at 51 units now, whatever you design, you might want to take a look at having potentially a lesser density than R2. Mm -hmm. I'm not concerned, but I'm wondering if Colt just is concerned. So that's one of the methods is rezoning. The other thing that you could do, and there are a variety of different tools in the toolbox, are there things such as building caps, where you say within a particular area, we're going to deem it harmful that um, more development could occur in a given year here than we are able to sustain or would like to see or how it would be a hurtful impact to the community, traffic, transportation. You have to provide some valid reasons behind it. Um, the town of Williston, for example, does have growth caps where they limit the number of new residential units that could be issued in a given year in different areas of town. Um, you could look to something like that within this area as well. Mark. That, that's my concern, or one of them with the rapid growth is the impact of traffic. If you get to this 50 year build up, is that assuming, contemplating that there'll be improvements to the roads in addition to the new So when we, when we looked at, at, with the commission, the in creating the LS1 and LS2 district, we looked with regional planning at that corridor and the capacity for it. And we tried to limit, particularly the LS1 and LS2, any new traffic that could be generated within that area to just the very minimal, um, because there are concerns about the overall capacity of, you, you can only widen West Lakeshore Drive so much. You only- the problem is, and here's the sort of short version of the story on traffic analysis, is um, we have limited capacity within that corridor because the background traffic coming into that corridor is increasing no matter what we do. So you have traffic coming from Burlington, traffic coming from Essex, going through um, that we don't necessarily have control over that's negatively impacting that area. So again, you would look to on our end, what can we do to help with traffic? You can limit the commercial uses um, and square footage. Um, residential doesn't add that much more in terms of traffic. And again, it gets into what specific commercial uses, but um, that's definitely an issue that could be looked at. start looking at that it's just a full circle of, does that mean more impervious surface does that mean more stormwater going into the lake does that change the obviously we're looking at wastewater but does that change what what's being put into the inner bay it's, it's a and that was I think the Planning Commission spent about a year in developing the LS1 and LS2 looking at all those little components of a much bigger issue So my last slides, I'll just sort of jump through. Um, I, I went through sort of where we've gone historically in leaps and bounds. And let me just get to my notes for a minute. Um, I added on because it ended at 2016. 
2017, we had 59 new homes, 47 single family and 12 multifamily. 2018, we had 39 new homes, 22 single family and 17 multifamily. And last year, we had 92 homes, 40 single family and 52 multifamily. Again, that was seven corners that came online. There's just, um, unfortunately, at the local level, we um, don't have great tools to forecast with. We can take a look at um, past growth to project future growth. And that's what this chart does. And that's the end. Is there anything that you want me to go back to or? But I think the sum impact is 113 new residential and 1.3 million for commercial mm -hmm. potential. If everything was left the way that it is now and everything built out. I do have a couple of emails from people that could make tonight's meeting that I'd like to provide if I can skip back to those. I'll check my email and just make sure I haven't gotten any more. Nope. So we have one from Bob Malil saying his concerns are scale, size, and appearance of the seawalls being permitted in the last few years or particularly in the inner bay along Lakeshore Drive. Um, back when he was on the DRB and Planning Commission, they were concerned with the seawall appearance, looking from the lake and restrictive in height and use of natural stone colored materials. Um, he's concerned about the amount of clear cutting new and upgraded homes are doing on the bluffs overlooking the bay, particularly an entrance to the inner bay from the outer bay. It appears these newer homes are cutting trees are not in the setback areas, but the heavy amount of tree cutting and vegetation looks like visual clear cutting scars on the tree line when viewed from the lake. Recommend a certain percentage, say 35% of certain size caliber trees other than needed for the structure. Thanks for the opportunity to provide citizen input. Um, I, I think he's referencing the Mungin Bay development. Um, which they 100% clear cut. They were not supposed to do that. We have requirements that you can only take out 25% vegetation, uh, one inch caliber or greater within a 10 year period along the lakeshore um, without a replanting plan. They did have a replanting plan. They also violated that. Um, again, it's being pursued in environmental court. There's not too much more I can say on it, but that was 100% clear cutting, which is not allowed under our current regulations and the size of the wall is more massive than the DRB approved and the, the regulations as well. So, um, very good points. If I, can I come on that? Having been out with Mr. Malillo on his boat last week, I think you may also, not to speak for him, be referring as you enter the bay, <coughs> and look towards the, uh, to the left over to Lost Cove Nankat Bay, the newer structures over there also tend to do a lot more clearing than has traditionally been done by the homes. So, the newer ones are very obvious as you enter the bay. It's an aesthetic thing. And those ones are interesting because it says 25% of the trees on the property um, mm -hmm. within the shoreline district. So what a lot of people have been opting for, if they have 1,000 feet of shoreline, is clear cutting 250 feet of it to get a really good view and then leaving the rest of it. So you see right in front of the house, it's completely clear. It doesn't require that you distribute that over a certain period. So there might be a good way of putting something in the regulations that would um, help provide that buffer and prohibit that. So um, we have another email from Dan Greeno. It says, hi, Sarah, I'm out not able to attend the meeting this evening. Do you have a couple of concerns for the record? Um, heights of construction on the lake side of the road should be lowered. It seems like folks are allowed to build about two and a half stories high. Uh, two, it seems new buildings are allowed to far exceed the original footprint of the old structures removed. These issues are causing the destruction of once was a very scenic neighborhood. So sad, Dan Greeno. So, uh, a couple of additional now. comments I'll make. Um, the, uh, the growth rates that you showed, I, I did figure out the charts, um, and it lets you squint and picture what's going to happen. I think the one half and one percent growth rates that you showed just intuitively might be a little low. Um, if you're starting with 277 units, the math is pretty easy. A half percent growth rate, you know, gets you to 1.4 units a year. 
and I, I think anybody that drives through that corridor would guess that in recent years we've seen more than one new unit a year. Um, and then, of course, the 1% growth rate, you get 2.7 units a year, suggesting maybe two new units a year. And so you're looking at the overall town number, um, and I know it's probably very difficult to get a growth rate for just one mile of road, but um, in kind of visualizing what the future might look like, um, it would be interesting, and maybe you've already done it, to project what a slightly higher growth rate looks like since uh, one new unit a year may not reflect reality as most people believe they've observed driving that corridor. So I was, as you said, it's very hard to pull a growth rate for a particular area of town, but I was just trying to go back through my recollection of any true new units that were added during my tenure here. Um, and the only two new units I can remember are on Churchill Lane, those new units that were in the process of being added, I think there are 13 in total, are the only new units that I can recall that have Which occurred. A 1% growth rate, or a half a percent growth rate would be the next decade. Um, at, you know, at less, or a unit and a half a year, so it'd be most of 10 years worth of growth rate there in one project at that half a percent growth rate. So, being here now for 18 years, those 13 units are the only new ones that I can recall in that corridor during that time. Does it mean that there's, my memory's not what it used to be because I have been here that long, um, but. Yeah, well, you don't need to argue the point, yeah. just for just observation and, and you know, mm -hmm. obviously I don't have the data on that. Um, another gets us into a enforcement um, rabbit hole that we probably won't explore too deeply tonight, but on the issue of staying within the same footprint for non-conforming use while expanding the height to 40 feet. Um, I'm wondering whether state law, which prohibits the expansion of a non-conforming use, would consider um, adding lots of additional height to a structure to be an expansion of that non-conforming use, um, simply because you're staying within the same footprint and maybe keeping the same number of bedrooms. And whether there might be a toehold within state law for the town without changing the zoning as it relates to 40 feet to take a much closer look at the uh, height that a uh, structure might go to if it's uh, non-conforming to begin with. Good points. Yep, it's definitely something to look at when we get to the East Lake Shore redevelopment um, uh, zoning again. So I, I think um, the purpose of tonight was to sort of take a little detour um, and it's a sort of dramatic foreshadowing of things to come um, because you are going to be getting back to East Lake Shore Drive within two years of the town plan adoption, which time flies. We're now down to you have a year and a half. And by the way, the last process took a year to do. <laughs> um, so time flies when you're having fun. We'll be getting to East Lake Shore Drive, I hope, as well as some rezonings after the Planning Commission has completed this uh, project for the Select Board. Um, and I, I think it's worthwhile to note some of the bleed over where the Planning Commission has jurisdiction over a lot of these concerns. Um, not that you have any solutions tonight, but at least um, I, I think you've been made aware of what they are now and hopefully have a handle in terms of what the development could be if you left everything as it is and didn't make any modifications. What our full build out could be at some point in the future um, and I, I think the questions is, is that too much? Is it the, not the right the type? What modifications need to be made is going to be continued, but, um, and please, as we move forward too, it's a good entree for me as your staff person in terms of what additional information you all need and how we make this understandable. Um, you guys work with a lot of this, it's hard to, be able to relay this to the public in an easy way. Build out analysis is one of those tricky things that um, you can look at a variety of different ways. And again, this one was done to give you the sort of the worst case scenario of how much development could you end up with worst case in terms of too much. Um, and again, I think what you heard tonight is the rate of growth could actually be increased. Well, I just want to speak to that. I mean, I'm still caught up on it's probably constrained now by the available septic. So maybe there's pent up demand and there's good open the floodgates. 
to a couple savvy developers who <coughs> will know, you know that they're sitting on a gem and that people will be surprised. But they could put in a septic, they could put a wastewater system in anyway. I mean, this build out could happen with or without the sewer. But well, we're talking about um, the lake, the L4 being four units per acre. And I don't, I don't know if an acre lot on septic on these soils could support four So units you have per out in the Porter's right. Point area? On West Lake, but not East. So, so you do have. Um, GD1 with the community septic, which we do find in Colchester, has 10,000 square foot lots similar to the L2. And so you do find that occurring with on-site septic. So there are pockets of areas in town that have the ability to do that dense development with on-site septic. Um, but I think we can take a look at different rates and we can definitely look at an increased rate um, and I'm open to hear from the Planning Commission in terms of what you think an increased rate would be, um, that we should, we can rerun this. Um, but that total build out, unless you change the zoning, doesn't change. So that total number of 113 units, unless you change the zoning, doesn't change. It's just how quickly you get there. There could be, um, could be, or there could not be. Um, I mean, do, do we even know the town's consensus? Does, does the town have a no growth or growth consensus? Our growth rate has been slow and steady townwide. Um, and unlike other communities that have put in place um, development um, constraints such as building caps, um, I can think back to once very early on in my tenure where that was a conversation piece of the Planning Commission, and that was still late 1990s when it was very high rate of growth. Um, but since that time, there hasn't been any um, need identified by the community or concerns that point of we we're going too fast. I guess I'm still hung up on this. I mean, it's like we've had conversations where we think growth is great, but what about growth in the inner bay? I mean, so what's the the consensus about, about having, you know, hotel, you know. There were surveys done when we did the original LS1 and LS2, correct? Yes. And I believe that everybody was happy with the slow rate of growth. They, they didn't want explosion, but they did want a continual growth. In lots of comments we've heard against the sewer, or several have been, it'll increase growth. Correct. Reasons against it. I think growth. some of those, when you tease them apart, though, if you look through some of the feedback that we received, is um, people look at development as sometimes just tearing down an existing place and rebuild it. So I, I think it's a little bit more nuanced. This gives you just the pure numbers of how many new units. But I think there are also concerns, and I um, don't mean to gloss over them by any means, because I think they're equally as important in terms of just the character of the area, uh, of tearing down that summer seasonal and rebuilding year round. Um, I, I think we talk a little bit about it in the town plan, previous town plans where we talked to how we transition from being a summer seasonal to more of a year round community and some of the sort of the negative impacts that created on some of the sense of some of our neighborhoods along the lake. Um, so I, I think there's development in terms of square footage and units, but there's also development in terms of what things look like, how high they are, do they block a view? Um, and those are all very important and my hope is that the planning commission when looking at East Lakeshore Drive, we'll take a look at the totality of that. Yep. 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 Any more questions? We have a question. My name is Scott Wood. I live on Blakely Road here. Um, at the start of the meeting, when you showed up the, the zoning maps, I believe, did you say, if, if I heard, I'm just wondering if I heard it correctly. Now, you said this is the proposed sewer zone, septic zone. Is that what you said earlier? So what's highlighted in red here is what was proposed to be served by municipal sewer and is the study area that we're looking at right now. So, okay, so that wasn't the, what was just, um, that we voted on back on town meeting day, correct? That, that sewer area? So, so if that had passed, the area that's outlined in red would have been served with okay. sewer. 
Um, and also for, um, I don't know if you know the number, um, off, if anyone has the number, but um, could you tell us um, what, how much taxpayer money went into getting that, um, that sewer vote up to the town meeting? Like if anyone has a total number on how much money that costs. That would be a good question for the administration and the select board. The planning commission was not involved okay. with that. We're dealing with the charge given to them by the select board to look at wastewater solutions in this area. Because they're I mean, brought I'm, on afterwards. And I, I work in town here and I have tons, you know, every day in our shop, we have people come in and that, you know, this always comes up. And the hmm. one thing that always, you know, I don't hear it a lot at meetings, but I hear it every day. It's like, um, and I know this isn't, the select, you know, you guys were given an unenviable task to try to um, rebrand something to get it out there. But it seems um, one thing I hear all the time is what part of no didn't they get for the third time? And I know that's not on you at all. I'm just, that's a big concern. I think the money, like if, if for just for public record, it would be nice just to know how much money was already spent we're looking at on that. Solutions. Oh, I understand. Yeah, I, like I say, I'm not. I'm, I, I want the lake to be clean. I really, you know, I really do. I swim in it mm -hmm. as much as humanly possible. So I'm, yeah. I'm just, That's just yeah. beyond our scope. Yeah. Okay. Well, I did, like I said, question. so that should like that, that number, the select board should have that number then, correct? Oh, not, I'll pass okay. that along to the administration. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. All right. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. 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 Uh, I got a couple other oh. items. Need a second. No, we got Rebecca. All right. Yeah, well, I'm you need a second and then you can amend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, are you seconding? No. Yeah. You need a second oh, before you I can discuss. Oh, I did. I second. Okay. Okay. Now, discussion. Okay. I agree with Robert. He wasn't here twice. Um, one second paragraph, last sentence. S had stated that revisiting whether or not there was pollution or the scope of the pollution. Something that didn't make sense there. I apologize. Which paragraph are you in again? I'm in the second paragraph. Starts with B. Starts with yeah. It's the last line. The last sentence. Stated. <coughs> Sarah had stated that revisiting whether or not there was pollution or the scope I of the pollution. A comma after revisiting. Yep. Should take care of that. Um, some, I, I think there needs to be an ending to that sentence. Um, yeah, there's something missing. Was not the scope of the PC. Okay. Um, um, I have to read this one out loud. The next paragraph, first sentence, Julie Smith asked why just the users would pay for the project and why pro protection of a community-wide asset could not be paid for by the larger community. And why the? Uh, I don't know. I guess the first time I read it, it didn't sound right, but I highlighted protection. So I think I think what you're saying is that they're trying to protect the bay for, uh, for the larger community, not just for the people who live on like East Lakeshore mm -hmm. Drive. Is that yep. what's trying to be said? So okay. what edit would you propose? Oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, uh, maybe crossing off A and put the. Okay. Yeah. And why the protection of a community-wide yeah. asset cannot be that paid would be for. Better. Okay. That's all I had. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. So um, I just had, it's, this is um, just a little bit above number three, that Ansel's felt that the discussion of the sewer was fraught with problems. Did she ever, did we ever get any specific, was that just a general statement or? 
I, I, I'm curious what she meant by that. Or did she ever elaborate on that? I, I don't I don't remember an elaboration, so I don't know how to address that or whatever, or how we should have addressed that. But I don't remember her elaborating on specifically what the problems were. Um, you have to vote. To that. Well, I'm I, worried about fraud problems. Where we are, where we are. Um, right. I'm not sure they had something succinct to put in. Right. That's right. Okay. Right. I just right. wanted to confirm that. So now we need to vote to approve with directions. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 So some packet information. Packet information. Really quickly, besides what you have in there. Um, the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Study Board um, is having a meeting at the Aiken Center on Wednesday, August 14th at 6 p.m. I can't attend, um, but you're all welcome to. I can give you the information. And it's just more updates on their continued study. Um, it's joint between New York and Vermont and Quebec about the issue of flooding and flood response along Lake Champlain. Um, they're working together with the Binational Lake Champlain Richelieu River Study Board to conduct a comprehensive analysis of the causes and impacts of past flooding on the lake and river, develop an improved real-time flood forecasting system, and recommend potential flood mitigation options. Um, so they're just updating people at that meeting. I'll pass along anything further that I get on that front. A um, couple other things that have come in that will be in your packet to the next meeting, but it will get sort of close. Uh, the city of Burlington is having a hearing on their comprehensive development ordinance um, form District 5 boundaries on August 27th. And you also, oh, that was this one. So those will be in your next packet. I just didn't want you to potentially miss the one on August 14th. You talked about wanting to know whether we are available a certain time at the end of the month. Yes. Is that good? I heard from Sarita. That? I haven't heard from anybody else okay. yet. I'm pretty open right now. I mean, okay. meetings pop up all the time, but we'll see what we can work around. Great. That's it. All good? Thank you. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> a second. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We are done. Thank you.